So let us get started with today's topic which is water resources. So this is a topic that is very important for everybody and it is, uh, it is something that uh, we, we can very easily relate with because water as you know is so essential for life uh, and uh, there, are, there are so many problems related to water which we will see in this presentation. Uh, there, are, there are so many things that we can do in order to uh, stop or, or reduce this problem. So uh, this topic is actually very interesting and um, uh, even my uh, students uh, when, I, when I teach them uh, this kind of uh, makes a good connection with them. So this is the uh, outline of my talk. I will first, uh, I, I know there are a few uh, teachers who are teaching this course for the first time and um, although we have all studied the water cycle sometime in school. Um, it does not hurt to just have an overview. So I am going to talk about that water cycle and uh, the reason it is important to actually start from the beginning is because uh, we need to intervene from the beginning also. Uh, so um, the first topic is the water cycle for which let us watch a short video rather than me explaining something which you are uh, already very familiar with. Um, I thought uh, it will be uh, good to show you a video. I thought that was a very nice video. I, I hope you all enjoyed it. It introduces all the various terms that are often uh, used in this context and which some of your students may need a little help with. So here in case you cannot show videos in your class, you know here is a, a relatively good uh, diagram of the water cycle which you could also show. Uh, the thing that I like about this is that there are numbers on, on each of those um, flows or fluxes and reservoirs um, and you, you see that uh, I mean you can, you can refer to this in your uh, leisure time, uh, but there are, there are actually numbers over here of how much rain, how much of the water vapor comes down as rain and things like that for each of these uh, uh, different features that you see like the the uh, mountains and the uh, rivers and things like that. So it is a pretty good image. Okay. So this is the water cycle and uh, you know that uh, we, we all depend heavily on it. Uh, it is extremely important for the biosphere uh, and uh, life and biodiversity as we uh, know it today uh, depends on, on this water cycle. So um, let us let's look at what is happening presently and uh, more specifically in India. So uh, th this trend is uh, in many parts uh, of the tropical world um, you have water scarcities and in India if we um, observe the period from just around independence uh, 1951 you see that we had uh, 5000 odd meter cube per year um, per capita. So the per capita availability of water um, since uh, 1950s uh, has now uh, reduced to under 1700. Now 1700 per capita per uh, meter cube per capita per year is um, said to be the threshold for water stress. So our country now is a, a water stressed country. So um, half a century plus of uh, development later. Uh, we have successfully managed to take our country uh, into a water stressed condition uh, from where it was. So 5000 was a pretty decent number, but unfortunately um, today the situation is very different. Um, and in India today we have several villages that do not have a, a reliable source of uh, drinking water um, and particularly in the hot dry summer months. Um, it is uh, really horrible. Uh, people have to walk uh, and particularly women have to walk uh, kilometers uh, to uh, get water for their family. And um, in urban places uh, you know how polluted our rivers are. Uh, you take the case of um, any, any uh, important city uh, in India, take uh, uh, Delhi, take Pune, Mumbai, Chennai, any, any city you will find uh, water bodies that are horribly polluted like this. I mean you cannot imagine um, 
drinking that water uh, or even bathing it bathing in it for that matter. Um, so, this shows how this water stress um, and scarcity all over the world is uh, actually a major problem and it is going to worsen it is likely to worsen and you see that India is already uh, red which means there is uh, high stress. So, um, something has got to be done and it has to be done soon. So, the question that comes to our mind as soon as you hear that we have a, uh, a water shortage, uh, the immediate thing that comes to our mind is uh, let us construct new dams and the larger the better. There is a problem, uh, there have been major people's agitations against large dams and um, we are all familiar with all the all the benefits uh, we have uh, when you have large dams you have plenty of water that can be supplied to large cities to industrial uh, centers uh, but and you can have long distance canals you can supply water from one state into another state so those are the benefits there are so many other things that come along with that hydroelectric uh, production the benefits that the the public gets due to uh, 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 reliable supply of water and electricity. So, those are all the nice things, but there are some other things which are which are also uh, which need to be considered and uh, they have probably not been considered adequately. So, uh, some of them are that the large numbers of people that get displaced in these large dams, they are often not rehabilitated well and um, they ha happen to bear the uh, bear disproportionate costs. Uh, of this whole thing. So, there are in a in a, a in constructing a dam project or any project for that matter there are some costs and then there are some benefits and you have to weigh the benefits against the costs. Uh, so, the benefits should exceed the, the costs. Uh, the problem here though is that the people who bear the cost uh, do not get the benefit. So, it is somebody else uh, bears the cost for the uh, benefit of someone else. So, uh, that is that is a big problem, uh, the there are also issues with the way the cost benefit ratio has been calculated uh, and uh, some major costs have not been accounted for. So, uh, let us say you have the benefits in the numerator and you have the costs in the in the denominator uh, and if you understate uh, the costs uh, the the factor appears to be artificially larger than it is. So, it, it the, um, the the project goes through uh, whereas, uh, people people suffer and the environment gets damaged. Uh, see rivers are are supposed to be flowing ok, they, they, they require a natural flow, you cannot simply intercept the flow of a river and expect uh, no adverse impacts. The uh, water that flows through uh, supports um, aquatic life, uh, the sediment that goes through uh, the, the river. Uh, is very important for the riverine ecosystem as well as uh, to the estuarine ecosystem. The estuary is the is the place where it meets the sea. So, uh, if if it does not get adequate quantities of uh, fresh water flowing through and sediment uh, and nutrients that come along with the sediment, if um, if you intercept that, then uh, it has uh, major uh, impacts on the um, ecosystems. So. Uh, moreover, you know you have migratory uh, uh, animals within the uh, rivers. So, uh, their migration upward um, and downward is um, hindered by this. Um, you must have heard about the, the Narmada Bachao Andolan and uh, there are. So, I have some uh, I know this uh, large dams versus uh, so, the large dams are perceived to be in national interests and uh, anybody who opposes that is uh, perceived to be against uh, development and against the country. Uh, I do not think we should take any any such uh, drastic view. Um, there is a there is a report and there is some reading material that I would like to uh, direct uh, all of you because this is uh, this is one topic where you can have a lot of discussion and debate in, in, in the class. And I commonly uh, in my class I have um, uh, like uh, like a debate with two sides and um, you know the people spontaneously form groups you know I ask them to 
just divide up the class into two and I say anybody who is pro, you know, uh, move, move, move from your seat and go over to the other side and, and vice versa. So you split the class and then uh, uh, I have another student uh, who, who notes down points on either side uh, on, on, on a blackboard I make like two sections A and B uh, pro and against uh, large dams and um, you know the, that one person uh, he or she notes down various points that are raised in the, uh, in the debate. So it is uh, really very interesting and students um, enjoy that activity and at the same time they learn so many things. So it is important that when you conduct uh, such activities in, in class uh, that uh, you yourself are familiar with uh, some facts and some details and uh, that you should share with your students beforehand and tell them it is coming. So one fine day if you suddenly spring a surprise on them um, for such an activity then it generally degenerates into uh, uh, you know just kind of a, you know hushing up the other, uh, other party. Uh, so nobody, nobody then is interested in learning. But what, what I think uh, we should encourage our students to do is uh, they should read up before and, um, uh, and then uh, they should come prepared so that uh, there, is, there is a lot of learning that happens uh, during these uh, sessions. The entertainment is, uh, is incidental, it always happens, you know, everybody gets entertained when there is such a hot debate. Okay, so, um, you know, faced with the water scarcity, uh, we, we generally tend to think that large dams are the solution, uh, but I, I just told you that there is another side also. So let us not jump to the conclusion that dams, large dams are the solution. There are, there are alternatives too. I am not saying that uh, the existing dams should be uh, dismantled or something like that. We, we have the existing dams and in order for them to uh, meet their uh, expected uh, anticipated benefits, uh, they must run properly. Um, but uh, in future, I do not think we can, uh, we can uh, build uh, many more large dams because most of the river systems we have already built very large dams and uh, uh, from a um, social point of view, it is going to be more and more difficult uh, to construct uh, more dams. So that is probably not the direction in which we need to go. Um, the other thing that automatically comes to our mind is okay forget about the, the, the rivers and damming the rivers, uh, let us simply drill bore wells. That is what we normally do if we purchase a, a house uh, somewhere and uh, there is uh, no reliable uh, city water supply then we construct, uh, we drill a bore well to get water uh, and that is what farmers do too because not, uh, not everybody is uh, fortunate to have a canal, uh, irrigation canal run uh, next to his or her own farm. So they drill bore wells and with the bore wells you can drill uh, holes really deep into the earth and you can get water. So they have been very popular uh, but again uh, if you look at um, whether that is going to serve us in the future and to what extent it is going to serve us in the future, you have uh, this map where the red regions are where uh, there is a severe depletion in the, uh, in the ground, ground water. So there are regions, very large regions which hold very uh, significant populations which are um, where the ground water is declining, the, the levels are going down and in, in places, I mean I am sure in this crowd of uh, 4000 people you must have had. Uh, a similar experience. I, the place I come from, I, I know that the water table is falling uh, by several feet every year. So um, th this, this can be a, a very serious problem and um, this immediately puts a, a, a limit to how much uh, ground water we can extract. Now you may then say that okay, if, if the surface waters there is a limit to how much you can extract in terms of building dams and the ground water also is depleting then uh, why not reduce water use. Uh, absolutely water use should be reduced uh, but again there is a uh, there is a caution over there because 87 percent of water uh, in India uh, goes for agriculture. So if you reduce the irrigation water 
uh, if you reduce the overall country's overall water consumption, uh, then it is likely to impact agriculture. So, um, what I am trying to get at through, through various, um, I am kind of giving various arguments and I am trying to um, uh, help you understand how a simple solution is probably not uh, going to come out. Uh, there are there are there are ways and uh, definitely we will discuss some of the solutions but maybe some of the things that come to our mind immediately are are um, are maybe not not workable now just since we are talking about irrigation and agriculture it turns out that um, roughly 50% of our food comes from the irrigated lands and uh, the rest 50% comes from the rain fed lands uh, so, 35 percent of India's arable land is uh, irrigated, rest is the 65 percent is, uh, is uh, rain fed. These are rough numbers. Um, so, uh, what, what it tells you is that the, the lands which are irrigated are, are highly productive or are relatively more productive as compared to those uh, which are uh, rain fed, which is kind of obvious, but I just wanted you to uh, so now we it looks like we are in a trap so you can't uh, you can't build more dams you can't drill more bore wells uh, you can't right away reduce the water that is used so uh, what went wrong i mean why did we get into this trap isn't india supposed to be the land of great rivers and lakes uh, sujalam suphalam malayajashitalam so we our in uh, the India that we imagine has actually such beautiful rivers, Gange, Chayamune, Chaiva, Godavari, Saraswati, so many rivers that we have. Um, so, what has happened to them? Well, before we see what happened to uh, those rivers and uh, water bodies, uh, we also have to see that I, I gave you the, the, the numbers for the uh, water availability per capita. So, part of the reducing water av avail availability is due to the increase in population. So, if you look at 1950, uh, it was something like uh, 359 million and 2014, it is uh, more than uh, 1200 million. So, uh, the naturally that would have an impact on the per capita availability. Moreover, uh, water pollution in India is very, very serious. Some 70 percent of India's surface water uh, resources are polluted by sewage and toxic chemicals. Uh, very few cities have uh, full sewage treatment facilities. There are, uh, there is somewhat of a larger number of cities which have partial sewage treatment facilities and number of cities in India are dumping uh, untreated sewage into either um, uh, surface water, uh, water bodies or some of it is just uh, seeping into the ground. Uh, the, the Ganga, Yamuna, you know how, uh, how polluted they are and the present government is, uh, has taken that as a very, very important agenda to clean up the Ganga, which is a matter of our nation's pride. Um, Sewage treatment in India, which is the point that I raised um, in the previous slide, um, is only uh, the, the installed sewage treatment uh, facilities are only uh, uh, sufficient for about 31 percent of the sewage that we generate in the larger towns and cities in India. So, it means that 68 plus percent of sewage is simply discharged untreated. So, if if uh, more than two thirds of our sewage is not even treated, I mean there is there is there are no facilities to even treat it. Uh, that is something very very disturbing. So with with such a such a large num large number of uh, the number that we saw of the sewage that doesn't get treated, then uh, you know it's no wonder that the water water bodies are polluted. So somehow or the other we must purify the water. So, if it is polluted anyway, then we simply purify the water before we drink it. Uh, but there is a problem here, uh, providing purified drinking water is not easy because uh, water which has so many pollutants, it has untreated sewage, probably some industrial waste, 
then some hardness in different areas you have problems like arsenic, fluoride contamination, um, pesticides and things like that. So when you have so many different possible uh, pollutants in water, then treating it uh, becomes very difficult. There are, there are some cheaper methods of uh, purifying water and there are some more expensive methods. The cheaper uh, methods are not effective for all pollutants and the more expensive methods are expensive so they, they cannot be applied everywhere. So just for your, um, to satisfy your curiosity, uh, here are the uh, drinking water specifications. There's, this is an Indian standard um, uh, 10500 which you can uh, go through and look at, look at what uh, the standard uh, of uh, drinking water uh, is for India. And then there are the WHO guidelines for drinking water as well as uh, bathing water. So uh, maybe, maybe you, could, you could have some um, discussions or um, assignments based on, based on this. And I am going to give you an example of something, something like that for your class. See, rather, th rather than simply having students read through it and uh, maybe memorize it or um, you know, face a quiz or something like that, maybe involving them in some creative activity uh, makes it worthwhile for everybody. So there are some people who think, uh, some people particularly nanotechnologists who think that, uh, like me, uh, I am also a nanotechnologist, uh, so who think that uh, maybe we can develop some uh, nanotech filters, water, cheap water filters that are highly effective and uh, still cheap. Um, yeah, that's a good idea and we should do that. Uh, we, we need to use water filters because we have to survive. Uh, the water is not, if the water is not clean, you still have to drink it. So we need some solution, uh, but that's, uh, I mean, stopping at that is, is probably not the best thing because um, it completely misses the, uh, the big picture. And the big picture is why are we allowing so much of pollutants to get into the water in the first place. So we need to address the larger problem uh, as, as well as providing an immediate solution. There are uh, some people who, uh, who even say that, uh, look, this polluted water and all that is not such a big problem. There's no need to panic. Indians have a very tough immune system and our bodies can surely handle a little bit of water contamination. Uh, after living several years uh, in the US, when I came back, uh, I uh, actually I had a similar kind of uh, uh, mentality, but after <laughs> After I came back uh, to India, um, I, I could not drink water anywhere outside. Uh, and um, it, uh, even today, you know, this problem uh, bothers me a lot. So um, again, this approach is not good because the health effects of uh, water pollution uh, are staggering. Uh, the WHO has published several reports and uh, you see that water sanitation and hygiene, all that put together uh, leads to some 0.4 million um, deaths uh, per year. And um, in India, roughly 1.5 million children under the age of 5 die due to water related uh, diseases. So you have extremely high social costs and as well as economic costs because leads to uh, something like a 200 million person days of work lost for the country. Uh, so, which, which amounts to maybe a loss of something like uh, 366 billion a year. So I, I have some references over here and you could, you could dig out more references, uh, but I think it's, uh, this much is, uh, is adequate to convince anybody of how serious the problem is. If we say that, um, you know, the, the socio-economic costs of uh, water pollution are so high, you might wonder, you know, where all those infectious agents, those pathogens, how they get into the water. The first one thing we already know, we saw that untreated sewage is entering our water body. So that's one very important reason why uh, our water gets polluted. But there's another uh, important problem, uh, which is open defecation. Uh, India is probably the, the world capital for open defecation. Um, this reference uh, says that uh, you have improved sanitation in only 54% of urban places and only 21% of rural places. 
Now you may say that, so basically you do not have uh, adequate sanitation facilities for some 839 million people. Um, now you may say that India is a poor country and uh, we cannot afford um, sanitation for everyone, uh, but it turns out that Bangladesh and Brazil, they, they, are, they are also poor. Uh, if we want to consider India as a poor country, I do not think that is fair to say, but uh, if you want to take that excuse, uh, then Bangladesh and Brazil, uh, they have open defecation only 7 percent and China only 4 percent. <coughs> So, I do not think really uh, there is any justification for uh, such a huge number um, in India. Now, if you say that uh, lack of sanitation is a problem, then uh, the solution is uh, very easy. Uh, just provide modern sanitation to all, not so fast. Providing sanitation requires more water. So, it increases the water demand, but the supply is already short of the, of the demand. Uh, I, I mean, if you if you really uh, try to think of how much water we are simply flushing down, and in most uh, cities in India, there is uh, only one uh, one uh, city water supply. So that is the same water that you use for drinking, is the same quality of water that you use for washing and bathing and everything, and it's the same water that you simply flush down the toilet. So uh, when uh, so many people do not have adequate water to even drink. Um, uh, how fair is it that uh, we people who live in urban places simply flush it down? Uh, moreover, if you, uh, if everybody uh, is provided uh, uh, improved sanitation, then uh, the problem is that we have to treat all that water. So, uh, but the treatment capacity, as we saw, is only about 30 percent. So, if if the if the total amount of wastewater to be treated increases very drastically, then you know we are in. A, much bigger problem than we already are. Yeah, so this is this is about the conventional uh, sewage treatment. If we do not have installed uh, capacity, let us increase the installed capacity of sewage treatment, but it takes uh, money to do that and uh, it takes energy to do, to run the, the effluent treatment plants. Um, our uh, uh, conventional effluent treatment plants uh, consume quite a bit of energy and a large portion of that energy is actually in uh, is consumed in aeration. Uh, so, if you are if you are talking about um, providing sanitation to everybody uh, and uh, which would lead to a very large quantity of sewage generated and if all that sewage is to be uh, treated using the conventional technologies, then we are putting a, 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 a large demand on uh, energy. So, uh, and our country already has uh, power outages and the grid is so unreliable and um, in many places they do not even have uh, electricity to uh, light a simple lamp. So, uh, in such a power hungry country, how fair is it to divert whatever precious little power we have to treating sewage. Uh, there, are, there are many other related complicating factors. Uh, so, before we, before we even move towards solutions, I want you to uh, just try to wrap your mind uh, around these related problems which are so many uh, which, which are complicating this situation. Uh, we, we just looked at the connection between water supply, uh, irrigation and agriculture, where I said that uh, 87 percent of the water goes for uh, agriculture irrigation, uh, which supplies 50 percent of our food. Now, uh, the, the reason for low agricultural productivity is not only the lack of irrigation, there are other issues also. One, one such issue is land degradation. In India, something like 32 percent of the land is um, degraded and uh, out of that 24 percent of uh, land is degraded due to desertification, which essentially uh, can be in a, in a simplistic manner can be understood to be uh, loss of soil organic carbon and loss of soil moisture. Now, um, for such soils, uh, organic carbon inputs can actually in the form of let us say compost or something like that uh, would, uh, would actually be very beneficial. So, I just want I have put I have marked it in green because I want you to hold on to this thought um, and we will see where it where we can uh, use this fact uh, very constructively. Now, there are 
again there are many related problems which you must have faced there are um, uh, many of our cities are uh, they, they, they are unplanned they are just growing uh, in all directions uh, there is hardly any planning they are overcrowded there is bad governance the present government is taking a lot of effort to uh, improve uh, governance and I think that is uh, exactly what the country needs. Um, so, uh, these, these problems complicate any possible solution. So, even if you have a good solution, uh, these problems are such that they would not allow the solutions to work. So, uh, now this is the point where we are going to take a, a, a small uh, break and uh, to discuss one activity. So, I have what I have covered so far, I want you to just mentally again uh, make a note of it or maybe uh, it is a good idea to actually use your notepad. Uh, most people uh, you know sometimes forget that, but I would like to remind you to just simply make a few notes of what we did uh, so far, what we have seen so far, uh, because all those all those things are uh, we will have to tie them uh, together in a, in a short while. So, um, what we did so far is we, we saw that the water available, we initially we saw the water cycle and how it actually is. Um, is kind of the basic support structure of life and as well as of uh, humanity uh, and what we are doing to, to that uh, natural water cycle, how we have polluted uh, the water bodies uh, in, uh, in places where you have cities and things like that and how we are uh, over extracting ground water, how we have dammed the rivers, disrupted ecosystems and things like that. And uh, we have got ourselves into such a situation where coming out of that or to uh, or improving our lot is becoming very difficult. Um, so, uh, I, I, I gave you various options of uh, you know why not develop a water filter or why not uh, do this, why not do that and, and, and it seems that we are we are kind of trapped. So, um, uh, let us uh, let us pause at this point where we have only seen the, the problem and now let us move to the uh, to the solutions part but before we do that uh, this is an interesting activity that i think um, uh, is very easy to do uh, in most places in uh, around most colleges and universities uh, because i'm pretty sure that there must be a, a, a water uh, body somewhere nearby uh, maybe a river maybe a lake uh, maybe anything else uh, which is polluted um, this can ideally it can be uh, integrated with a field trip. So, you take students uh, on a field trip, maybe you ask them to, uh, to prepare, you can give them some reading material before that. Um, there, are, there are like uh, newspaper uh, clippings, there are uh, technical reports, there are some papers published. So, you can uh, maybe the, the teacher also needs to do some homework beforehand, uh, identify uh, the, the, the water body, give supporting material to your students take them out on a trip, have them make some observations. Now, if you have a civil engineering program in your uh, college or institute, where you can do some uh, water quality testing, uh, that will be great. Or if, uh, if you have access to some, some, uh, some lab which will share the information with you, then that is also a good idea. Um, so, I, I mean it is it's up to your, uh, up to the facilities that are available to you and your interest and motivation. Uh, but this can be a very good uh, assignment where you take them on the field, you show them uh, uh, various things. You can even uh, tie up with a, a non-governmental organization or you can take them to a, a governmental um, uh, office, uh, you, you know a representative from there if they are willing to uh, work together with you uh, and uh, try to estimate uh, or at least get a feel. Maybe you can design a form where you have let us say the hardness or the coliform organisms or a few parameters which are easy to measure in your lab or, or for which you have the data. And uh, you can have the students fill out uh, those forms uh, either based on the material provided by you or based on some observations that they make uh, and things like that. And uh, then have them compare it with uh, again the Indian standard over here is mentioned the WHO guidelines are there. So, maybe they can tabulate their observations or their uh, whatever their um, uh, the, the the local data with the standards and try to maybe write uh, uh, maybe a small essay on 
uh, what are the main water quality issues uh, of that water body near your um, institute. And uh, if there are any other issues like eutrophication or uh, drying out during the summer or flooding during the monsoon, let them document that also. So this can become a very um, interesting uh, assignment and activity. So rather than, rather than having them uh, learn this topic, um, uh, you know, in the, in the conventional mode where you initially um, uh, draw the water cycle on the board and have them copy it down and uh, then have go through some definitions and things like that makes it extremely boring. They can do the same thing um, centered around an activity. So uh, let us say you promise them uh, to uh, promise to take them on a field visit, uh, but in order to come for that field visit uh, that they need to understand some basics and uh, they, they, they need to demonstrate some, some confidence some level of confidence in uh, their ability to uh, gather data or things like that. And then they will learn, you know, because now it, it's, a, it's a good motivation for them, then it does not become a burden for anyone. Uh, and um, uh, I am mean, sure everybody will enjoy that. Okay, I, I, what, what I would suggest is, uh, I know you do not have uh, much information right now, most of you probably do not have uh, good information about the water quality, uh, at least you probably do not have quantitative data on the water quality uh, of a nearby water source. But why do not we take about uh, 5 minutes for people to just write down, maybe just identify a, a particular lake or uh, river or whatever, whichever water body is close to your, um, your institute or your, maybe your native place if you are, uh, if you are living far away. Um, uh, just make a note of it and just to the eye, uh, what you feel is, uh, is the biggest concern. Uh, related to that uh, water body. Why do not we take a few minutes, I will, I will go through various centers and see what they have to say about it. So please take this time to make a note of the water quality of an important water body uh, around your institute or around your home. Techno India, West Bengal, can you make can some hear. comments about a nearby water source which you, which you are aware of? Yes. Uh, I am from West Bengal as you can see from the name of my college and the river Ganges flows uh, just beside my flat. Oh, excellent. So I have seen people polluting the massive river right from the morning. Okay. So it is like if you go to bathe in the uh, ghats, the water at the level where people can just go down and take a dip is extremely dirty. Yes. And every possible human activity is alongside. I do not see the government taking any concrete steps uh, as of now. There is a lot of uh, writing in the papers, etc. and I guess uh, Benares is first on the list. So maybe someday. I see. Uh, it's, it's sad that there is not much happening over there, but that is an interesting observation. Thank you for sharing it with us. So uh, can, you, can you imagine uh, uh, maybe a, a a class activity which you could take up with your students related, since you are uh, right, right by the Ganga, maybe uh, you could think of yeah. some way of yeah. introducing yeah. that to your students yeah. and involving them. Yes, yeah, sir, it is possible because my institute is perhaps around say, uh, could be 20 kilometers away, but it is nevertheless, it is not impossible to take them along for a field trip to such sort of a location. It is not impossible. You may have heard of Dakshineshwar. In West Bengal. Sorry, could you? Ah, oh, Dakshineshwar, yes, of course. My house is, uh, say, about three kilometers alongside the banks of the Ganges on the opposite side. Wonderful. On Hooghly. Wonderful. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for sharing. Thakur College, Kandivli. Hi. Wow. So much energy in this class. Hello. What did you all have for Yes. <laughs> Give them a big hand. Awesome. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. We have uh, Daisan Nadi near our college, near our area, and it is highly polluted after when it uh, comes out from the core forest, that is Sanjay Gandhi National Park. And uh, we, the people, uh, as we, as Professor in the earlier session, he said that we are the collectors, and we have done that. 
we put lot of uh, dirt into that and which is not treated uh, there is no management for the sewage that is uh, the solid waste management is not been done properly so there should be some or ac other action to be done in this area as well as methi everybody knows that pavai which runs from pavai and comes to bandra creek it is also highly polluted because of the industrial activities in between that's the uh, two areas which i could share to you thank you so much uh, it's it's actually uh, an interesting point you know i was i was talking about uh, the uh, the lack of water treatment i mean so uh, one thing that actually it, it disturbed me a lot when i when i actually saw those numbers that when we uh, use the toilet and we flush the toilet you know that it's two thirds of the sewage since it is not treated it's almost certain that somebody is going to die because you use the toilet so because we are not treating it and you saw the so many millions of uh, deaths due to uh, due to water and of children under 5 it is so right. pathetic uh, it is very disturbing yeah. so i don't uh, i i have still not got to terms with that so do you uh, think there should you could be some action from the pe people side also yes yes certainly certainly uh, can you can you think of something you can do with your students maybe maybe along with yeah, uh, some already. organizations that uh, that are working in the area of water in the college itself the uh, natural service scheme that is nss also works for certain activities but they are insufficient i do think so uh, because at certain level the students can go and clean it up but later on it is the stakeholders that is the public that has to take care of it every time students can go and do the cleaning job no i i understand uh, it is more about sensitizing and educating them because today your students yes. may appear to be helpless students but to, they are decision makers of tomorrow so you you don't know who yeah. they are going to be i mean i i know a, a bunch of my students uh, they have uh, taken the civil services exam so uh, you know they, they some of them are uh, within a short period of time they are going to be very powerful people uh, the, uh, yes the students can be a key uh, role to play those who are go coming into the public domain and they can give solution for us but they should have that decisive power and policy making uh, powers also sure thank you so much for sharing ks rangasamy college hello uh, dr ramesh from ks rangasamy college of technology tirchangod namakal district tamil nadu sir sir we are using ro water uh continuously long time sir is it good for health sir we are using ro water long time uh, is it very is it good for our health sir i i don't i don't see any problem i mean at least i am not aware of any problem related to ro water i mean if if the ro is working fine it should be fine sir good afternoon sir uh sir you have explained the sewage waste water treatment is it uh can you explain any recent technology of uh, treating this sewage water which will be useful for us for the future and which will be easier and uh, less economic which will be helpful for our area can you explain any recent technology yes we are going to we are going to see some some such technologies uh, and obviously they are not developed by me but i will definitely share some uh, very nice ideas with you and maybe if you come across uh, better ideas please share them with us uh, so that everybody can benefit okay thank you sir in in the first part we saw the water cycle after that we saw the the various dimensions of the of the water problem that uh, india is facing in, in terms of the depleting resources pollutions dams and scarcity and all those things uh, now uh, it's uh, we are at the point where we are going to discuss solutions and uh, in the solutions uh, i am going to divide the solutions into into two broad areas one is the demand side and the second is the supply side so in the in the demand side uh, what, what we will be concerned with is how to make sure that adequate water is made available and in the supply side uh, how do we ensure that we are using that water well whatever water is made available how do we use it well so the supply side is how to use the water efficiently and the demand side is how do we make sure 
uh, that adequate water is available. Now, um, in the in that, uh, I'm, I want to emphasize the importance of uh, rainwater harvesting. If you just look at the rainfall map of India, uh, maybe you will uh, observe something that is quite obvious that something like 70 to 80 percent of uh, India gets at least 40 centimeters of rain. So, if it gets uh, that much rain, then maybe uh, rainwater uh, harvesting and watershed management might be uh, workable solutions for most of India. Uh, I, I made this quick uh, calculation which uh, you, could, you could repeat uh, for yourself also. Uh, le let us say that uh, per capita per day, the drinking water need is something like 5 liters. If you, if you prefer a slightly larger number like 7 liters, you fe feel free to do that. Um, assuming 5 liters per capita per day of drinking water, so it is the water that you use for drinking and the water that you use for cooking, water that is ingested. So if you um, assume 5 liters per person per day, uh, it works out to uh, something like 1825 liters per person per year. Now, if we, if we look at the rainfall uh, at 40 centimeter average annual rainfall, let us say you, you live in a place where you do not get too much rainfall, you get only 40 centimeters of rain per year and, and, and it turns out that maybe 70 or 80 percent of India gets that much of rain. So, you are probably the majority which get at least 40 centimeter. So, how much of rooftop area would you require to satisfy that need of drinking water. And it turns out that roughly 5 meter square of rooftop area would be sufficient, assuming no losses. So, if you want to assume some losses, uh, then, then you know you can increase the area slightly. <coughs> so, um, if you have had uh, 5 meter square per capita um, rooftop area, with 40 centimeter uh, rain, you would collect 2000 liters and that 2000 liters would last you for the entire year for one person. So, it is it's actually very interesting in that the rain uh, even in places where they do not get much rainfall is actually adequate to supply you with drinking water. Now, that may not be the case for all the other water, but at least for drinking water there is not a major problem. So, then what happens is that uh, the collecting the rainwater is not a big problem, storing it is a problem. So, storing it can become a little expensive. For instance, uh, I think most people, maybe people living in uh, up, uh, small apartments probably have these, uh, uh, these plastic uh, overhead water tanks. The common size uh, that they have is uh, 1000 uh, liters. So, you would, you would need two such tanks for every family member. So, if you are a family of 5, then you would need 10 of them. So, that is that's quite a, a large quantity of water to store. Now, of course, not all that water needs to be stored because uh, during the ra uh, rainy season, you actually need to store only for uh, uh, the, the dry spell, which may be like 8 months or so uh, in India because um, we get monsoon in 3 or 4 months. So, it is only in the dry months that you need to store. So, you do not actually need to store 2000 liters, but you need to store little less than that, maybe 1500. But nevertheless, it is a it is a large quantity of water that has to be stored. But uh, storage costs, you know, the, the, the plastic uh, storage tanks uh, are probably among the more expensive methods of storing water, but there are cheaper ways. And it turns out that uh, these cheap ways of storing water have been around for hundreds of years. Um, I am from Maharashtra and many other people too are here from Maharashtra and they know that in Maharashtra we have these hill forts uh, uh, of Shivaji. In, in Rajasthan also I think there are similar forts. So, uh, on top of these forts and they are, they may be as, as high as uh, maybe 3000 plus feet above sea level. And uh, they are uh, the Sayadris in, in these parts. They are they are flat on the top. So on top of these uh, uh, these hills, you have uh, hundreds of water tanks uh, and as well as uh, wells that have uh, been developed. 
So like whole armies could actually uh, live on those forts and uh, survive. Armies including soldiers and horses and everything. And uh, there have been uh, incidents when the, the fort had been surrounded, uh, these forts had been surrounded by the enemy for months together. Uh, but because there was so much of water uh, on there, and, and mind you that, that in Maharashtra you don't have um, uh, rains during the rest of the year, it's only during the monsoon that you get rains. Um, I, I, I'm presently living in Koimatur and there, uh, there are two monsoons, there's a return monsoon also. So um, that is not the case in Maharashtra, it's a fairly dry uh, region, but the Sayadris do get a lot of rainfall. So, uh, so all that rainfall that falls in the, in the monsoon, they, there, there, are, there are these water tanks that they cut, uh, cut into the rock, uh, it's a very impervious rock, uh, and they cut uh, these uh, water tanks into it, and there's a lot of water that they store. So they, this, this has been going on for, uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, in, in South India, uh, there, is, there are these uh, temple tanks. So every, every uh, temple uh, has got these ponds or tanks that, you know, basically the, all, all the, all the um, water from the paved surfaces uh, drains into those ponds and a large amount of water is collected. I think that's uh, very common in many temples. So you have, you have some sources or some reservoirs of water. Uh, and because particularly these temple tanks and ponds, uh, because they are sacred, uh, they, are, they are preserved and they are, uh, at least in the previous centuries, the, it was uh, kept very clean. Uh, things have changed and they have got, fallen into disuse and uh, people have polluted them nowadays. But uh, if similar systems can be developed in, in those days, if people could think of so many things and they could, uh, as a, in an extreme case, I give you the example of how entire armies can sit on top of a mountain and still have no water shortage. Uh, I mean, uh, can we not do better than that? Can we not store water today? Um, through community self-help, the cost of storing water uh, in such tanks can be drastically reduced. In the, in the Sahyadris, uh, there, are, there are so many umpteen examples of uh, storing uh, water. Um, that in, uh, in places uh, other than Maharashtra also there are uh, many, many examples. So uh, th this is again something that you could share with your students. Uh, I suggest that people do some homework on this and try to identify local uh, water harvesting structures uh, that, uh, that are there in your area and either integrate it with a field trip or maybe you uh, take a trip down there and maybe make a video out of that. Uh, and share it with your students. Uh, I'm sure that they will they will appreciate it much more than if you merely tell them. So uh, the the benefit of collecting the rainwater is actually that uh, instead of taking water from either a, a groundwater source or a surface water source, which has lots of pollutants, including the sewage or industrial waste or all these nasty pollutants instead of taking water that is heavily polluted and then finding out a high tech way to, uh, to clean that up at a low cost, which is almost like an impossible situation. Instead of doing that, you already take water that is clean. So the rainwater is quite clean and with very, very little uh, uh, treatment, it can be made uh, fit for drinking. So uh, this kind of circumvents that problem uh, and the, the loss of life uh, can be drastically reduced that way. So uh, here's another activity uh, that, um, that can be done uh, very easily in your class or um, I, again I, I request the faculty members to first uh, try out these simple calculations. You can find out the actual uh, average annual rainfall of your city and um, the, the total rooftop area uh, of, uh, that is available to your family. So in case you live in a, a three-story apartment, you have the total terrace area uh, and uh, let's say there are three stories so you have to divide it by three. So that's the actual amount of rooftop area that is available to you um, and you can estimate how much uh, water, uh, rainwater you can harvest out of your uh, rooftop uh, based on the average annual rainfall. Is uh, everybody confident about uh, being able to do uh, this simple calculation? Okay, I'm, I'm going to check on people. I'm going to ask people uh, how to calculate that. Uh, you could probably assume, um, let's say, 20% losses for 
evaporation and first wash. Uh, there is something called as rejecting the first wash. So, the surfaces on which you are collecting the water could be dirty and so the, so when the, when the ra rain falls, um, it is a good idea to first reject some of it and in polluted places, you know, as the rain falls through the atmosphere, it could pick up some contaminants. So, it is it's a good idea to reject a small part of the, of the water that falls first on the, uh, on your surfaces and then collect the rest of it. Um, now, um, uh, this is a, a, a kind of an interesting uh, idea. How do you design, if you were uh, designing your own rooftop rainwater harvesting system, so you have these hardware stores and you have these uh, various uh, pipes of standard sizes and things like that and you have some storage tanks, uh, all, the, all the nice stuff. Do you think you can, you can design your own rooftop rainwater harvesting system? And within that, how would you design a first wash uh, rejection system? Uh, if my question is not clear, how do you design an automatic system by which the first wash, let us say the first x liters of water is rejected, it, is, it does not go to the storage tank. Uh, how can you design a system uh, like that. Uh, I, have, I have thrown this question uh, to my students and I, they have come up with really innovative uh, solutions to do that. There are solutions out there, uh, but it is, it is more important for some good ideas to come from the students. So, uh, I am putting this uh, question to you and um, uh, <coughs> uh, I, there, there, is, uh, there is one, um, maybe uh, one suggestion I can give. In that, uh, if you can design a first wash rejection system without any moving parts, all the better. There are, there are some which have, uh, let us say they have a, a tilting bucket kind of thing, uh, where they, there is a lever and there is a suspended bucket and uh, the water, first wash water goes and falls into a bucket and when it fills up the bucket due to the weight, the lever kind of tilts in a direction and then the water goes through a different channel. So, that is, uh, that is one thing uh, that you could do, but how about something without any moving parts? Uh, do you think you can uh, design something like that? Um, I will just, I will just um, go to the viewer and ask a few colleges if they are able to do that. Ohm Institute, how you could uh, design such a system? Hello, architect Nagendra Narayan here. Yes. Uh, sir, in our area, basically the water crisis is the main problem. Yes. So, uh, there are a number of factors uh, besides this, uh, behind this, sir. Uh, first is that water table of this particular area is very low, due to which uh, we, we can't uh, uh, got the water through the different types of uh, means. And another, another basic thing is that this particular district, these are uh, is adjacent to the district of Churu, Rajasthan. So, uh, these are the factors that is uh, working on the particular water crisis. Another issue, the TDS of the water is very high, that is not uh, uh, able or uh, for the drinking, as a drinking water. Although government and number of NGO working in this particular field and try to solve the problem, because water is essential for the life. So, what is Our the average campus, annual rainfall of your place? Uh, about, sir, uh, uh, approaching to 35. Oh, I see. This, uh, this area is very hot. This area is very hot in the summer season and very cold in the winter season due to the adjacent to the Churu district. I see. So, Rajasthan has got a number of uh, very innovative water harvesting structures. Uh, do you normally it introduce your students to uh, those techniques and do you take them on, out on the field for visits? But the, 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 the district, Churu is uh, actually a water crisis is the main issue in that particular area and uh, in that particular area, sir, basically RWH uh, technology we adopted, uh, basically dig out the a well and collecting the water and purified water uh, by uh, by mixing the uh, redox site, whatever the uh, uh, chemicals and uh, 
that is that is for the purifying of the particular water i personally visited number of uh, well such type of reservoir made by the ruler in in particular ruler area exclusively in the rajgarh tahsil maybe if you have visited uh, if you take pictures or maybe take some small video clips of uh, what you observe over there and share it with your class i mean it is i know it's not the same thing but it's probably the closest you can get to actually taking your students uh, out on the field you know sometimes i know it's a bit difficult uh, but i think it makes it much more interesting to uh, uh, to actually see things uh, that are out there rather than merely learn from textbooks yeah definitely i'll i'll be share in the future classes i'll try to uh, provide the details information sir thank you so much sir i have a question yes sir, sir uh, there is so much pollution in our country that uh, we are putting so much waste in the different rivers mainly in the ganga why there is not uh, uh, any obstruction on the different country, uh, different industries why they are putting so much waste that we have to apply so much cost we have to need to clear the ganga i don't think i have an answer for that but i think the best answer i have is that we love creating problems we simply love creating problems uh, so that we can we can be busy solving them sir i have another question sir uh, just now my colleague was telling to me that uh, in gurgaon in haryana the 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 different society they are employing the water harvesting system in the society or the buildings the i want to know that there is a, a success of these rainwater harvesting that the ground water level has improved from the past years is that a question or are you telling me no yes, i want i uh, no i am asking the question oh. that is there is a success of these rainwater harvesting systems Uh, we are using them since last many of the years yeah I, the ground le water level has been upgraded or not uh, i uh, a good question i mean i hope it has increased uh, it, it's something on the right track so i i really hope that in gurgaon the levels have increased after uh, large scale adoption of rainwater harvesting but i i i am not able to comment on whether it has actually increased or not okay sir thank you thank so much thank you sir SDM Institute. So, does anyone Hello? have a have an answer to my question? Hello. Yeah, that rainwater harvesting. Uh, how would you reject the first wash? Do you have an answer to that? Hello. Some easy nifty uh, design. Is it here? You. Uh, the first wash. Uh, there are, uh, I think, uh, probably uh, two three methods that can be followed to, for to reduce the that uh, first wash uh, loss. Like one is the uh, charcoal, uh, which can be. I mean, the water which is used for wash, uh, it can be. Uh, stored and the charcoal method is can be used for uh, uh, settling down the whatever the waste and also we, uh, we can wait for some uh, uh, keep it into a i mean uh, storing that into a tank so later on we can uh, uh, get it uh, separate uh, the top layer water and uh, uh, like that uh, some part of the, the waste can no my question was uh, when it starts to rain let's say it it just starts raining right now okay and uh, i have to wait for 5 minutes and then i have to manually connect uh, it to the the storage tank can i have it automated without any moving uh, parts yeah pro filter using filter is probably solution okay uh, yeah fine thank you i i was thinking more on the lines of rejecting the the first wash and then collecting the rest so i was looking for some some way of doing that there is a, there is a very easy way there are many ways jj magdum college uh, good afternoon sir good afternoon uh, sir uh, uh, our place daisingpur uh, which is surrounded uh, by two famous rivers one is the krishna ganga uh, krishna and second is panjang uh, sir it is uh, continuous repeatedly problem uh, we discuss uh, since uh, our independence that uh, rivers are surrounded by textile industries sugar industries the drainage of all uh, uh, cities are getting mixed up with the rivers so i would rather say it requires the more political will 
and the low cost of processing plan to solve this particular problem i want your opinion uh, on this particular problem uh it requires a uh, political will yes. to solve this particular problem and uh, low processing uh, operating plants which led the drainage of cities to mix up with whom unfortunately to the river yes uh, i i missed some parts of what you were saying but i think what you are um, saying is that there is a need for greater political will on this issue uh, absolutely i totally agree with that uh, there is a need for political will but i think there is also an equal uh, need for the public to be sensitive about this we often times don't care i mean we have seen so many polluted uh, rivers polluted lakes and all that and we we pass by through our vehicles and uh, buses and trains and we see all these water bodies polluted uh, covered with uh, uh, water hyacinth and what not and uh, we we uh, we have become so used to it that we uh, don't find that objectionable if we actually uh, stop uh, accepting it uh, the way it is and uh, demand for change only then uh, the political will will follow that's what i feel okay thank you sir IES College Bhopal. Hello there, Bhopal. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Actually, uh, I was for first time to talk to you, <laughs> and I would like to thank you for this, uh, organizing such work. And uh, uh, the session first was very interesting, and this session was also inter very interesting. Uh, actually, uh, last month I traveled to Patna, Bihar, where chance to uh, visit uh, river ganga where i saw the very many uh, industrial waste uh, were uh, getting dumped into into the river ganga and uh, a very uh, you can say the uh, pollution uh, water pollution uh, is uh, very uh, in very critical uh, situation was there yes so is there any any uh, kind of uh, uh, restrictions uh, I, so that uh, such kind of uh, dump uh, uh, can be, uh, you know, can be restricted. So, see, we we have regulatory me mechanisms. It is not that our country does not have pollution control boards. We do have them, but this is the this is the scene in spite of having the pollution control boards. So, uh, it means that the there is something going wrong. There are multiple things going wrong at multiple points. So, the the public no, also has to take uh, cognizance uh, of that. The industries are not following the norms. The people who are supposed to enforce the norms, they are probably not being that effective. Maybe some of them are are very uh, uh, very particular about enforcing. Some of them are probably not. So uh, there are uh, there are gaps uh, everywhere. Okay. Is there any uh, kind of uh, such, such type of programs organized for the industrial person who is uh, actually uh, 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 responsible for that? Uh, uh, workshops organized for polluting industries. Okay, I'm I'm not the best person to answer that. Maybe there are. Uh, I'm sure there must be, uh, but I I don't don't have direct information about that. So I I suggest uh, the, I have. Uh, Throughout uh, this uh, session, I have given several ideas of uh, the uh, of activities and assignments that you can give to your students. Uh, the The idea is not to burden your students, but uh, it is to involve them in a positive manner. Uh, to involve them in uh, uh, you know taking the responsibility for whatever whatever is happening. We all need water, and we all are facing uh, the socio. Um, economic costs of uh, polluted water so it is very important for each one to even at a, in a personal capacity to take some some small steps and these are these are ways by which if not uh, e even if there is no no direct impact at least it will uh, educate uh, your your students uh, very well and and uh, the the motivation problem that we discussed towards the beginning of the course uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, that many students do not know why they are studying this course uh, i mean uh, when you are talking about these topics i don't think anybody in their right mind can ask how this is relevant to me uh, i mean is is drinking water not relevant to uh, to us it is obviously very relevant 
and is the polluted water or the polluted water body uh, near your home, is that not relevant to you? Obviously it is. So uh, I think throughout the course, uh, this um, there, the effort uh, should be on, on part of the teacher to um, change this perspective of students where they feel that this course is not required for them or is not useful for them. Uh, they should leave the class thinking that, uh, uh, thank God I, I took this class, I got to learn so many new things. I will just wind up with this slide saying that, uh, you know, the, while I am while I'm recommending rainwater harvesting, um, all the all the rainwater, uh, it, it might not be possible and economical to uh, store all that water, but what cannot be stored, at least it can be recharged to the aquifer. There are ways in which that can be done. Uh, there are government agencies, uh, if you check around your area, there are government agencies which will uh, disseminate uh, the all the necessary information. They will. Uh, there are also um, uh, uh, outfits that will uh, help you install a, a rainwater harvesting system uh, in your home. And in some places, it is even compulsory. So um, th there is adequate information. It is only that we need to uh, take interest in that. Um, in in situations where uh, rainwater harvesting by itself is not sufficient. Um, or not possible, uh, that then the other uh, high tech options which are probably a little more expensive uh, can be considered. So it is not that we are banning all the others, uh, but it turns out that uh, we have high levels of poverty, we have major uh, pollution and uh, we have adequate rainwater. So it is uh, kind of a no brainer to use alre uh, the already pure rainwater rather than uh, rather than trying to purify already polluted water. Okay, so um, we will uh, reconvene after the break exactly at 3.30.